And here's been the word we've said each week to you. Supply equals grace. Demand equals law. For every demand of your life, the demand for you to get up and get out of bed today, the demand of a lot of people today who have all this pine pollen, a bunch of them have texted me today. You know what? That puts a demand on you, doesn't it? The demand to pay your bills, the demand to raise children, the demand to go to work, the demand that you can think about in every arena of your life. I've got great news for you from the cross of Jesus Christ. He has borne every demand that you could ever imagine. Doesn't mean that in those demands that it's always fixed and changed, but I want to tell you, He gives you a supply in before the problem, during the problem, after the problem, and around the problem. When the children of Israel lacked food, He gave supply, manna. When they were out with Jesus and they were hungry, and He gave supply by multiplying the five loaves and two fish. At the wedding feast of Cana, when there was not enough, there was lack in the wine, He multiplied that and there was supply. At the man at the pool of Bethesda, he lacked for 38 years being able to have a healing in his body. Jesus came to him and there was supply. And the porch that he was on had five porches to it. And the man of grace walked up on those five porches and gave supply because grace is always supply. So here's what we want to tell you today. You don't only have a supply you have a supply of victory. No matter what your circumstance is, ladies and gentlemen, you have a supply of victory. And here's the greatest thing about it. You don't have to attain it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to deserve it. He has given it to you. You have total victory as a gift. And let's look at the first scripture that explains that. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Let's look today at supply of victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Next verse. The sting of death is sin. Now, that doesn't mean sinning. That means a sin nature. Once that sin nature was in a person, then death has a sting because you're not saved. You're not going to heaven. You're not redeemed. But now that we have sin dealt with, taken away, as far as east is from west, then there is no sting when you die because that sin has been dealt with. So as Brother Jim teaches all the time, you go from this life to that life. There's no pause. There's no break. There's just a transition. But the next part is so good. The strength of sin is not your bad flesh. That's part of it. It's the law. How is the strength of sin the law? Because the law tells you something that is a holy standard but you, in your own strength, cannot attain to it. So it shows you your lack. Why? So that you will turn and say, I need a Savior. Next verse. Here we go. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Didn't say you earn the victory by keeping rules. It isn't to say you deserve the victory because you've been holy enough, but just simply because you said yes to Christ, a victory in every aspect of your life is given to you as a gift and not an attainment. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the next verse. Now, because of that, look what we can do. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. You see, when you start to apply the supply and you apply the victory in every potential challenge and defeat, you're going to be steadfast, immovable, Amen. always abounding in the work of the Lord. Oh, Pastor, I thought this grace thing would make you lazy and indolent and not caring and do whatever you want to because God's not going to do anything to you anyway. Well, let me tell you something, saints. If you're simply motivated by fear to do good works, you've never heard the gospel. Because the gospel does not say that grace is an excuse for whatever. It says grace is the reason you will be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, because that grace is Christ. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hallelujah. So, I praise my way into victory. The victory is already mine, but what did he say about it before? Thanks be unto God, which give us the victory. So today, if you are facing a defeating, seemingly insurmountable situation, speak victory into that potential defeat. And it's not the speaking that does it to you. That's religion. It is what Jesus provided for you that's the victory. You simply then take it and apply it. Hallelujah. Let me show you another scripture, a couple of scriptures you want to look at today. Proverbs 21, 31, over the New American Standard. I love this brief little verse here. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. Wow, we're ready to go. We're ready to win this battle. But you know what Solomon is saying here? Uh-uh. Your ultimate victory is not going to be won by your diligence, but victory belongs to the Lord. The only ultimate victory you'll ever walk in is His. You hear us say all the time, we fight from victory, not for victory. We had a couple who used to come to church here and also with us at Courts of Praise, the Ola Jabutus, lovely family from Nigeria and came here and they established businesses and so forth, went to the veterinary school at Auburn University. And when their son, one of their sons uh, got a little older, he turned out to be a fantastic football player and he played over at Auburn. When I would run into the old Jabutu sometimes because they were so busy in their business, I said, hey, did you go to your son's game? No, I couldn't make it, but we watched it on a replay. And we already knew that they won. Not every game. But the one time I talked to them, we already knew that they won. And so we began to talk about it, and they said they'd watch the replay. I saw them on a Sunday. Of course, the game was on a Saturday. They watched the replay on a Saturday night. And so they were saying, hey, we know that they already had the victory. So as we watched the bumps and the bruises, we watched an interception, we watched the penalties, we watched the uproar, we watched the crowd saying, oh, that ain't fair, that's not right, that's a bad call. And he said, in the midst of all the challenges of the game, we weren't worried. We already knew what the victory was. So we could go through with our son all the challenges and difficulties and be just fine. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our walk with God. We already have the victory, and I don't mean just heaven now. Praise God for that. I'm talking about the victory when you go to work Monday morning and you're dealing with a cohort that you can't stand, that you don't like being around, who has an ugly mouth and who talks against your Christianity. You can have a victory as you speak victory into that place of defeat. You are calling forth something that you don't have to battle on. You already know the answer. When you go and see the doctor and you're worried about what the return will be, regardless of the return, I want to tell you, you're victorious as you go in there because you go with the confidence that the Lord is with you. The battle is the Lord's. We know the victory up front. Are we going to have some challenges to go through? Is there going to be some fouls? Is there going to be some offsides? Is there going to be some interceptions? You bet. How many of you in this place like wrestling? Okay, prayer at the end for that. Wrestling group will be over here to my right. <laughs> well, if any of you ever talked to Chick Donovan, you would know <laughs> that in wrestling, the winner is already predetermined before they get there. They'll throw chairs at each other. They'll throw each other out on the ring. They'll fall on each other. Of course, most of that's kind of fake. But I want to tell you what, they beat each other up pretty good. I'd see Chick and I said, Chick, I know y'all know all those moves. He said, yeah, we know the moves, but it kills my back. <laughs> so folks, the same thing. Yeah, we're going to have the devil fake us out. We're going to have the devil tell us you're going to be slammed. You're going to have the devil tell you you're in and out. One day you're in, the next day you're out of God's favor. But the truth is the winner's already been declared ahead of time. Some bumps and bruises, yeah, but you already got a winner ahead of time. Now look at this place over in Ephesians 6 and verse 13, back in the King James for a moment. You all are familiar with this? Every part of your spiritual armor, every part of it, has already been used by Jesus. And he was victorious in every piece. 
It's not your armor. It's not your place to try to make the armor produce. All you do by faith is realize that you have it on. Not put it on, have it on. So it says, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now, these next words right here in my King James Kenneth Hagin faith edition of the new King James Bible, <laughs> it says in the margin, not just having done all, but having overcome all. Who do you think did the overcoming? You? No. It's his armor. It's his shield. It's his helmet. It's his belt, it's his shoes, it's his sword. So he's saying to be able to withstand an evil day and having overcome all. Who's overcome it? He has. So now the last two words is you, to stand. You don't have to fight in the battle. You take another one who has fought it for you. So now you stand because he's overcome all. And how do we do it? Let's look at this scripture. Let's look at 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4. So if you don't fight, see folks, what I'm teaching you today totally changed my way of spiritual warfare. I was trying to fight the devil. I was trying to beat the devil off. I was trying to yell the devil down. I was trying to call down the principalities and stuff over each area. And I'm not saying anything's wrong with that. I'm just telling you, Fighting against the enemy knowing that you already have the victory is a total change of mindset, total change of belief, total change of perception that changes the way you pray. When you come from victory, then you're giving the total credence to the work of the cross that it deserves. If not, you're going to be working mighty hard. So how is this done? Simply. For whatsoever is born of God, that's you, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Everybody say the next three words. Even our faith. Wow. So what is your victory in? Simply believing what he did and taking it as your own. Wow. That's the replay because it's the word of God. Remember I told you years ago when I was in high school, and I know I've told this story before, but I add something to it today I never said before. I told you I was on a high school golf team. I was a freshman. Our senior team, well, I played on the team. I was like eighth or ninth man. But our team went state tournament then, back in the 60s. And uh, we were winning, and we won it. Up on the 18th hole, I'll never forget, it was a three-par hole up in Lexington. And it was a hole that would go down and just a, a huge drop-off. So if you'd hit like a wedge or a nine iron, it would just kind of go up and just drop down. This one guy on the team hit this beautiful shot. He hit it up in the air, and it dropped down about a foot from the pin. He knocked the putt in. We won the tournament. I'm only a freshman. The seniors were really doing it. But when we got down there to the celebration, the one guy that had hit that shot uh, turned over to the coach and said, my stomach's killing me. I, I can't stay out here. I got, I'm sick, man. I am so sick. So I don't know if he got a stomach bug or the flu or what. I couldn't believe he hit a shot like he did in the, sit, the stomach. So by that time, the Louisville newspaper, which is called Louisville Courier Journal, the Courier Journal had already come in with pictures because this was a state golf tournament. And here our Catholic prep school had won. And so here's this guy. Oh, man, I'm so sick. I can't gotta go back to the bathroom. I just, I don't know. I got cramped something horrible. And so here's a Courier Journal. They had the, the uh, table over there with the big trophy, State Tournament Golf, Kentucky. And so this guy runs off. So the coach says, Montgomery, get in there. Stand in there. Stand in the middle. And so I didn't play. I was just a freshman. I was just out there waving at everybody, you know. So, so he comes and says, hold that trophy. And so I, I held the trophy. While the other guy was a five-man team, one guy was in the bathroom, so the other four were there, and I'm in the middle holding the trophy. I didn't do a thing. I didn't hit a putt. I didn't have a shot. I didn't pull out the three-wood. Nothing happened. But you know what? I'm the victor. 
I took that picture and showed it everywhere. <laughs> hey, Mom, hey, Dad, hey, look here, look here. I, I didn't play anything, but we won, we won, we won. And I'm holding the trophy. Let's see, ladies and gentlemen, that's you. That's you. Somebody else won. Somebody else went down for you and gave you the trophy. Now, you can hold it up to the devil. You can hold it up to your past. You can hold it up to your mistakes. You can hold it up to your disappointments. You can hold it up in the face of every kind of evil that's tried to assail you and say, look, and you hold up the cross of Jesus Christ. You are a trophy to him, and he has granted you that victory. A couple of places in the Old Testament where this comes out. Let's look over at Joshua 6, verse 2 in the New American Standard. Joshua 6. Well, no, we can do that in King James. It's okay, Jennifer, I'm sorry. Joshua 6, verse 2. Joshua hit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, oh, Jericho. This is it. But I want you to see something. We always thought the walls came a-tumbling down because of the shout. We thought the walls came tumbling down because they walked around for seven days. Well, I want to tell you what, not quite right. Look at this. The Lord said to Joshua, see, now that's the key in walking in your victory. You've got to see that victory before you come to it. You've got to see. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Colossians, set your mind on things above. See on things above <clears throat> where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. What's at the right hand of the Father? Victory. Why did he sit down? He won. He only stood up if he was still going at it. He sat down because the work was finished. So when the Lord said, Joshua, see. Now, Joshua, I want you to see something here. I have already given into thy hand, Jericho. I've already given you the victory, dude. And the king thereof, they're yours. I've already won it for you. And the mighty men of valor, ha <laughs> ha, they're mighty men. They're going to be nothing to you because you won't even have to fight. I'm giving you the battle ahead of time. Now look at the next verses. And you say, well, then why did he do all this other stuff? And you shall compass the city. And ye men of war, go round about the city once. Does that sound like a battle? Not really. Thus shalt you do six days. Next verse. And seven priests. Seven's always the type of completeness and victory. Seven priests shall bear the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day you shall compass the city seven times, and then the priests shall blow with trumpets. Four times he speaks victory. And he sets it up before they even do it, so he already sees it in his sanctified imagination and says, this is how you will lay it out. Now, why did he do that? Ladies and gentlemen, that was their place of releasing faith in the victory already given. And that is what James calls faith has what? Without, work, uh, without faith, excuse me, without works, faith is dead. We've got to have works. And you know what the best word for that is not just works. It's corresponding actions. I know when the Lord has spoken to me and said, you're going to have this victory. I know when the Lord, that's what Brother Jim was talking about, what faith was. It's the persuasion of God. Well, I want to tell you what, when God gives you a persuasion based on his promises that he speaks to you, folks, I want to tell you, He's going to show it to you like he did to Joshua. Then for you to walk in it like he did with the seven priests and the seven trumpets on the seventh day seven times. What's that saying? He's telling you, I have a prescribed picture of your overcoming power through me into this situation. That's what John said. What was John saying? Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory, even your faith. That was an act of faith. It was a corresponding action based on a promise. That's how you walk your life, ladies and gentlemen. You see it ahead of time. Now, let me show you another place. Look over, y'all know this one well. 2 Chronicles 20. 
2 Chronicles 20, good old Jehoshaphat. He had the same thing like Joshua. He had a battle and the victory was already declared. Do you know the victory in your life's already declared? Amen. It's already declared. You say, well, nothing's changed in my life. Well, you still have victory if nothing ever changes. You're still a victor. Now look at this. Here's Jehoshaphat at this time. Jehaziel the prophet had given a word to them and his, here's what he's spoken. He said, they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Decoah. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. Go ahead and hit the next verse. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. This is what Jehaziel, the prophet, had said do. Now remember, they'd already seen the victory ahead of time. Here's what the victory was that Jehaziel had spoken. He appointed singers of the Lord, and they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. So Jehaziel said, the battle is the Lord's. You won't fight in this thing. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Do this. And sing. What? Do this and sing. But they got swords and spears and horses and chariots and they're mean looking dudes too. <laughs> Lift your hands and sing this song. What song? <laughs> Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. We don't know what the melody was. I got a feeling it was a powerful melody. It was like how great thou art. It was something full of life and full of vigor. Well, can you imagine, folks, how vulnerable a group is? They didn't say turn your back to the enemy. They said go straight at them. Your whole solar plexus is exposed so they could throw a spear right through you. So you're lifting your hands up. You're not even allowing your hands to be used for victory. You're in a vulnerable position. And you say about yourself, about your holiness, about your law keeping, about how much you fasted, how much you've given in the offering, how many times you attended church? No! They declare His victory that was spoken to them. And so now they say, praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. Some translations say, for the Lord, He is good. His mercy endures forever. Y'all remember one time when John Cheesby was here? He went through and found all the places in the Old Testament where that song was sung. It was flat amazing. And most all of them were in places of battle where the Lord had already prescribed the victory. Amen. Look at the next verse. One more verse. And when they began to sing, you see they were singing because it says, we have the victory. It's already done. It's already declared. It's already prescribed. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord, not them, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir which were come against Judah, and I love the last four words, and they were smitten. I want to tell you, when you declare Jesus' victory, demons are smitten because they cannot stand up to it. I've told you this story before. I always tell the same story. So. <clears throat> we told you about Linda Short out in Nebraska, the lady who was a witch, who was also moved up to the place. I didn't know until back then that a woman could be a warlock. Well, she was. Sacrificed two of her own children, as horrible as that was. But Linda got gloriously saved. We did a deliverance on Linda. I told you it took probably, how long did it take that afternoon, Joe? Hours and hours. We were pastoring an Assembly of God church out in uh, western Nebraska, which, by the way, right now is flooded bad. But uh, we were out in that area, and uh, Linda had come in, and we had prayed for her. I told you that story before. I asked her, I said, uh, she had come in and asked me if she could teach children's church. 
And man, something just got on the inside of me because she had been coming and she always put cash in the offering. I mean, big things of cash. We're talking 19, what years were there? 84, 85, 86, somewhere in there. 30 years, better than 30 years ago. Good night. And we'd always see back then, man, Linda would have her offering envelope, and she didn't, and it'd be hundreds, $100 bills in there. We loved it. <laughs> it was awesome. Wow, always cash and always $100 bills. So she comes in smiling and says, I would love to help you in children's church. I just love kids, and I would just love to help out. And something in my spirit said, ask her if she knows Jesus Christ as Lord. And... Uh, I said, uh, Linda, that's great, and thank you for your support. It's been great to have you here in church. And uh, she's always just dressed to the nines, and uh, but something was weird. So I said, Linda, uh, you know, I don't know you all that well. I'm glad you've been coming the last two or three months. Glad you love kids, and we always need help in the nursery and need help with children. Just, would you just, I, Linda, I just got this in my heart. Would you just say this with me? First tell me when you were saved, and then just, just say it with me. It would be, wouldn't it be so good, Linda, to say it? Just say it with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. And she couldn't do it. And she got out her, her handkerchief and, <coughs> oh, Pastor, <coughs> she didn't have a cold when she came in. And she starts coughing and <coughs> all this stuff. I said, Linda, you okay? And I pat her on the back. You okay, sister? Yeah, it's okay. I, oh, I, I'm fine. I'm fine. I probably can't stay very long, Pastor. Probably, probably. I said, Linda, just stay for a minute. I said, just, just say with me one more time. Jesus Christ is Lord. Then tell me about your salvation experience. <laughs> Linda, you okay? You okay? <sighs> Man, my chest just burning, Pastor, just burning. I, I got something going on. Okay, Linda. Say it with me one more time now that you're not coughing. <laughs> just say, Jesus Christ is my Lord. And then tell me about your salvation experience. She starts hacking again. She gets up from the chair and says, I gotta go, I gotta go, Pastor, I'm feeling really bad. I gotta go. Well, the whole time, my secretary, I was telling you, like wonderful secretaries, like Joanna was, like uh, Jeanette is, very discerning in the spirit. My secretary, her name was Charlotta. And Charlotta out there the whole time was praying in the Holy Ghost. And here's, I'd hear her out there and she'd pray in tongues, and then she'd say, the victory is ours, the victory is ours. Blah, 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 pray in tongues, pray in, pray in, pray in tongues. The victory is ours, the victory is ours. And she kept praying victory. Well, here's what happened. Linda gets up, and Linda's a big, tall woman. And so she comes out the door. She's coughing and hacking. It's the middle of the summer then. All the doors were open. We didn't have any air conditioning on. It was a nice day. And so she runs up to the door and can't get through the door. But the door's wide open. And my secretary then is also already doing one of these. God is the victory. He's given us the victory. God's given us the victory. God's given us the victory in the name of Jesus. And so Linda comes up to the door, and it's like the Colgate shield. She can't get out the door. Then she starts screaming. Well, we had another set of doors that was parallel on the west side. This was on the east side. So she runs over to the west side and tries to get out the door. And Charlotte, about this time, is on two feet. The victory is ours. The victory is ours. Hallelujah. The victory is ours. The victory is ours. The victory is ours. Victory is ours. And this is the sweetest little demure woman you've ever seen in your life. Up there, both feet going down on. And so Linda comes to the door. Ah, 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 ah. And she comes back in, and we realized in a moment we didn't have anybody wanting to help with children's church. She wanted to infect those children with demonic teaching. Well, I happened to have a pair of, uh, of wonderful gals in as evangelists. Nita and, what was the other gal's name? Nita and Melinda. And Nita and Melinda were just right down the road. I mean, not a mile from the church in a motel. So we called up and said, I need you all up here right now. <laughs> and so uh, Nita comes up and we start, long story short, we started in a full length deliverance. It took us eight hours. She came at me. She grabbed a can. We had a communion table. It had big candelabras on it and had big sharp points. She came at that candelabra and started swinging at me with that thing. I hate Jesus. I can't stand it. Ah! And boy, we would come back every time with the victory, just what Charlotte was doing, jumping in there and praying in tongues. The victory is ours. The victory is ours. The victory is ours in the cross by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus. See, there's tremendous victory in the blood. After all that time, 
getting her in there for that deliverance, we started to realize this. From the beginning of the time she walked into that building, the victory was already declared. It was already there. Why? Because the Spirit had spoken a promise to my secretary and then later to me. And there was no way that this situation was going to explode into some awful thing. The victory was declared and the victory was stood upon and the victory was the supply for deliverance for this woman. She got set free. She became a voice for God. She spoke all over the place. I want to tell you today, y'all, the victory is yours, and he, the devil, is smitten and is out of the way. Jesus, before he went to the cross, had already had, you all, a picture of victory. I won't even go into this one because it's just so good. But it says over in John 17, verse 4, I don't have, we don't have to put it on the screen. In John 17, 4, it says, Jesus speaking and declares this, the work you have given me on earth is finished. What? He hadn't even gone to the cross yet. The work you've given me on the earth is finished? What was that? It was him declaring into the finished work what Joshua had seen, the picture of his deliverance. Wow. He was already seeing the work because what? He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. world. So he was already seeing that work is finished. Then he goes on down in the 11th verse and says something even more unusual. He says, and now I am no longer in the world. What? He was already seeing to the resurrection and to the ascension. Was that a place of avoidance? Like when you declare victory and you say, well, there's really not any problem. No, we're not Christian scientists. No, we're not believing that you just say something and the saying makes it happen. No, I want to tell you what. Jesus was saying, I'm no longer in this world. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I'm going to go through this. But I have the picture of the victory that will carry me through the nightmare that I have to go through. I already see his supply. I already see what he has done. I already see that he has given me the grace to walk through this. That's why I don't believe, Brother Jimmy, you and I talked about this again, that the Father was away from Jesus when he was on the cross. He didn't turn his back on him. He let him carry the penalty of the sin. But it says God was in Christ, in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So in the moment that he was on that cross, he wasn't separated from God. God was there with him. That's why I love in Mel Gibson's movie, which we'll show a clip of on Easter, when you see the big teardrop come out of heaven right down in front of the cross, it was showing that the Father was right there with him. He was upholding him. And so he's saying, before I even go to Calvary, I already see the victory. Will it be hard? Yes. Will it be unbelievable? Yes. Is he doing it for you and I? Yes. But does he see the victory ahead of time? Ahead of time. Wow. A couple more things. New covenant places. Look over at Romans 5, 17. Ooh, I, I did all that jumping up and down like my secretary. I got to take my coat off. Romans 5, 17, wow, how do you reign in life? Two things. Two things are part of this work of faith. It says, for if by one man's offense, that's Adam, death reigned by the one, Adam, much more they, us, which receive, here's our two things, abundance of grace, we'll call that provision, and the gift of righteousness, we'll call that position shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. What's that mean? You have today provision for whatever challenge is in front of you. I don't care what it is. The cross is that big. It's given you 100% provision. Ah, but now he's given you the position of righteousness 
to be able to facilitate the provision. If you weren't righteous, then there'd be no way for you to receive that grace because you don't have Jesus in you. As soon as you said yes to Christ, you took on the full righteous standing that Jesus has. If you didn't have that righteousness, there'd be all the provision in the world. It'd be like you saying, I got a million dollars in the bank, but I can't get into the bank. The bank's closed. The debit card won't work. I can't go to the teller machine. I can't get in the bank. It's never going to open again. You could have all the provision in the world, but until you have the position of access, there's no way you'll have the victory. The gift of righteousness shall reign. Now jump up to verse 20. Jump up to verse 20. Moreover, the law entered. Here's a good one, y'all, just for a little Bible study thing. Why the law? Why the law then? Many answers, but here's a good one. For the law entered that the offense might abound. Because if we were in this room today and we had 12 entrances, like I told you before, but only over one of the entrances it said, do not enter here. Employees only. Very secretive. Stay out. What do you think your focus would be on? It wouldn't be on the other 11. It'd be looking at that. <laughs> the law entered to make the offense big so you would say, I need a Savior. But look at the last part. But where sin abounded, and that's not just sins, that's every result of sin that would cause you any kind of challenge. Grace did much more abound. Hallelujah. No weapon that is formed against you shall. Ah, <laughs> no weapon formed against you shall prosper. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their what? Righteousness is of me. In righteousness, you can say, no weapon, no weapon, no weapon. No demonic weapon, no sickness weapon, no money weapon is going to stand against the promises of God that are yes and amen to the glory of the Lord. Well, a lot of our scriptures I'll carry next week because we'll go too long. Not that I've ever minded going too long. <laughs> so what is more than a conqueror? Well, we've answered this before too, but let me say it. If you were a conqueror, if Jesus came back, or, or the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, and said, praise God, you all are conquerors. What would be the implication? You did it. You earned it. You stood against the opposition, and you won. I've given up on that kind of spiritual warfare. <laughs> I take the winner in there with me. I take like I was as a freshman in high school. I take his trophy and say, look, devil, this is what I have. So now, more than a conqueror would be that I have taken what the conqueror has earned, he's given it to me, and I, like Jehoshaphat, and I, like Joshua, don't have to fight in the battle. I just enforce the victory. And that is by faith. And that's called in the Bible the place of rest. You battle from rest. So now you don't have to lose your cool. Not conquering it yourself, but receiving a victory through him. Let me tell you a person who some of you know, the former pastor of this church. Precious man, Pastor Will Fisher. He died in May of 2008. I came here in the end of October of 2002 and got to enjoy almost six years with him. What a precious, godly man. Folks, he had Parkinson's disease, and he didn't get totally healed of it. When he was 55, it hit him. And they said he wouldn't probably be able to minister ever again. Well, guess what? He went from 55 to 75 and continued. But now the shaking didn't stop and all that. Well, on Sunday nights, back in those early years when I was here with Pastor Will, what a delight to have a senior pastor you get along with so well. He'd already stepped down. I was here with him. It was a blast, y'all. 
uh, looking over the wonderful years I've been here and enjoyed it so much, that was some of the greatest enjoyment with Pastor Fisher. Delightful, wonderful, comical, talented, gifted man of God. And we'd come in on Sunday nights. And I remember we had a Q&A. We did a Sunday night Q&A. That was a lot of fun. Just asking any kind of theological question. If we didn't know it, we'd have to go to the bathroom. So <laughs> somebody asked that night about the question about being more than a conqueror. And Pastor Will immediately popped up and said, well, you're leaving the last part out, brother. It's more than a conqueror through him who loved us. And here was Pastor Will Fisher, shaking, hard time moving around, never lost that smile off his face, never one time admitted any kind of defeat. Now, he acknowledged his problems, but he never gave in to it. I turned that night and looked at him. I said, Pastor Will, you're more than a conqueror. And he turned back to me, y'all. He, he wrote all kind of poems, stories, Noni, you know. And he came back this night. I think it was a thing he already had in his heart. And I, and I wrote this down because I said, man, this is more than a conqueror. Did he get past his Parkinson's? No. But he was a conqueror right through it. And here's what he said to me that night. He said, I'm sorry. No matter if I shake, and even if I quake, I know he will make a champion out of me. And sometimes he would shake, and it would become, as he'd call it, and he'd laugh about it, a quake where he just couldn't handle himself and he had to sit back down. But I remember that night afterwards, we went on through the eighth chapter of Romans. And I told him afterwards, I said, Pastor Will, this is you. This was like 2003, 2004, right in there. So I want to look at right now because this is the picture of more than a conqueror. This is a picture of a man who had every kind of challenge and walked in victory. This is a picture of a person who continued in ministry when everything else said, stop, quit, give up, don't, leave, stay away, get into self-pity. You'll never make it. You'll never go through. Oh, no, he did. And he was an example to this man, big time. Well, here's the part I want us to look at. Look at Romans 8, 35. Ah, uh, here we go. <laughs> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? See, that's what the enemy tries to do and say, you'll never have any victory because the Lord doesn't love you because you've messed up too many times because you have finally broken the chain that connects you and Jesus together. Now, what a bunch of lies. You bet. What shall separate us or who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or the sword. Next verse. As it is written, now here's the Apostle Paul doing the famous thing that he would do. He would go back and actually have you look at the opposite side of what he was saying. He'd actually go into a negative direction to point out the positive. And so he writes this down from the Psalms. This is a quote. And so he says, for thy sake, we're killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Watch the next word, next verse. What's the first word? It means no, doesn't it? So what's Paul say? Old covenant? Yeah. New covenant? My secretary, Charlotta. No, no, no. Yes, that pen cost me 20 bucks. <laughs> no, 
I am not going to be separated from the love of God just because I've gone through hell, just because I'm going through a terrible situation, just because I have something that has tried to take me down. I'm not losing my victory. I'm not losing my focus. I'm not losing my ability to take the promises of God that are yes and amen and apply them to my life by faith. In all these things, all of them, we are more than conquerors. Now, did it say, in all of them that have gone away and I no longer have those? I'm more than a conqueror? No. Pastor Will had a lot of victories. I was with him three days before he died. Guess what he was doing, y'all, on his deathbed? Well, he wouldn't like it, me saying it was his deathbed. He would say it was his passing bed. <laughs> I went up there, and Miss uh, Virginia said, Pastor Alex, you better come on up. He's pretty close. I got up there, y'all. I've never seen anything like it. He was laying on his bed preaching. There was nobody else there but me and Virginia. Other people had come in. He was preaching a sermon on his bed laying flat. And here was one of the verses which is on his tombstone right over here in the graveyard. Now get this for victory. <laughs> he was preaching Colossians 1. 12 and 13. <laughs> Giving thanks unto the Father who has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And catch this next verse about a victory that's already been given. And now I just take the victory. Listen to this. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has, this was Pastor Will, translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, he was being translated by death, but I want to tell you what, he was already translated when he said yes to Jesus as a young man. Amen. The translation had already been accomplished, and so now he was simply receiving the fruits of the seed that had been planted, and the harvest had now come. But what does it say in that scripture? He's delivered us. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. And later in Colossians, it says this, you being dead in your sins and your uncircumcision of your flesh, he's quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. So you have victory over your trespasses, victory over your flesh. Don't you say, I can't help it anymore then you're not proclaiming the victory that the circumcision of the Spirit, not a physical circumcision, but the circumcision of the Spirit says the flesh is cut off from my spirit. Now my flesh doesn't rule my spirit anymore. My spirit can say, I have the victory. I'll walk in the victory. I see the victory. I am a victorious person. So Pastor Will was declaring on his deathbed a victory statement. Two days later, he closed his eyes. That is more than a conqueror. Amen. You say, well, Pastor, how do you really say that it was more than a conqueror? Let's just read these verses on through. No, in all these things we're more than a conqueror through him who loved us. Next verse gets even better. For I'm persuaded. Everybody say it with me. Here we go. Start that verse off from the beginning. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, next verse, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah! No separation. None. So why was Will Fisher a victorious man? Why was Will Fisher more than a conqueror? Because with all he went through, with the shaking, with the quaking, he knew he was a conqueror. Why? Here it is. He was never allowing himself to be separated from the love of God. He never once said, oh God, you did this to me. Oh God, you must hate me. He never put law into a situation. He just walked in victory in the midst of it. That's what it means to be more than a conqueror. That's who you are today. Stand up with us, would you please?